All right, so we are now joined by Cedric Johnson. He is professor of Black Studies and Political Science at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He's also the author of the books Revolutionaries to Race Leaders. And of course, his latest is The Panthers Can't Save Us Now. That is out now from Verso, and we'll link that in the description box below. Cedric, it's really good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks for having me on. So there's a lot to cover. Um, Obviously, we'll be talking in some detail about the defund the police movement and what the sort of trajectory and the limitations of that have been over the last two years. But I want to start by opening up with, I guess, kind of just a broader um, sort of sort of question about policing in the U.S., because there's obviously been a massive amount of organizing around police violence over the past decade. um, And there are clearly very many problems with policing in the U.S. So before we start by just diving into what the efforts around policing reform have looked at, um, I thought maybe you could begin by outlining what you sort of see as the major problems of policing in the U.S. And the reason I'm asking this is because I noticed in your writing and in uh, some interviews that I've heard with you, you often use the term stress policing. And I'm bringing that up because I I literally have never heard anybody else use that term. Maybe Adolf Reed here and there, uh, but you use it a lot. And I think that it really Really gets at something por- important about policing today. And so I wanted to ask you why you turn to that term instead of comparing policing to something like the new Jim Crow or, you know, like modern day um, slave patrols, right? Those are other terms that we hear a lot. So uh, what's what's going on with policing in the U.S. today? Right. So let me let me maybe talk about two things uh, maybe connected to, right? So there's policing, as I understand it, um, before World War II, which is broadly trained against um, the working class in terms of the repression of of, uh, strikes, um, managing uh, crowds and other problems in cities. Um, We could go back further, you know, as you just mentioned, as the the use of slave patrols, um, you know, even before or around the same time we see metropolitan police departments being formed in different parts of the country. So I think there's that there's the way in which it is it is directed against working class people more generally, slaves, factory workers, vagabonds, all sorts of folks uh, across the country. But after World War II, I think there's a significant uh, shift that takes place, right? As the American working class becomes more middle class in terms of its consumer capacity, as many people leave central cities for suburbs and uh, begin to enter to enjoy a kind of uh, consumer lifestyle that wasn't available beforehand, um, the very basis of policing shifts, right? It's no longer broadly directed against the repression of trade unionism. Uh, you know, in, in some, there's some moments where it is, but over time, um, that kind of regular confrontation be- between police and strikers, police and, and organized labor um, shifts in some significant ways. What happens instead, you know, after World War II, And we see this, especially like in the writings of people like uh, William Parker, when he talks about um, his role as the chief of police in Los Angeles, he sees his role, he sees the role of police as this thin blue line. He uses that that language. Uh, And it's important, you know, for a lot of your your, uh, viewing audience to to remember that Parker was a military guy, right? He he stormed the beaches at Normandy. He had this experience of being in in World War II. And so Parker um, brings a lot of that that ideology to to uh, to domestic policing, and he really sees the this role, this thin blue line, as protecting middle class society, middle class virtue from these various corrupting influences, in particular uh, what he called godless communism, um, organized labor. I mean, not or, organized, uh, not organized labor, less so, but more more increasingly. Um, um, organized crime, right? And um, um, blacks who are now migrating into a place like Los Angeles and filling the the, uh, the uh, ghettos of the South Central and, and Watts uh, sections of the city. So I think um, that's essentially where we are from the 1940s and 50s onwards, right? Policing, which is there to serve and protect um, the middle class, but is increasingly trained on the the uh, the dispossessed, the unemployed, the ghettoized in the country. So when I talk about stress policing, it's really a way of summarizing um, a focus on particular neighborhoods, particular kinds of nuisance crimes, 
um, particular forms of criminalized work, whether it's drug dealing or, uh, you know, sex work, mm -hmm. um, that become the real focus of most police departments across the country, no matter what city or locale they're located in. So I think that's what's missing um, for me from a lot of the accounts that we hear that refer to either the, the new Jim Crow or um, those that are more focused on a racial, you know, uh, frame of what's happening. Yeah, I mean, it seems that uh, obviously, you know, um, since the sort of first Black Lives Matter protests after Ferguson and the killing of Eric Garner um, in New York, uh, race has really been sort of the central focus. And 2020, as we know, was kind of this big racial reckoning, right? The horrific murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis uh, on it, on the heels of, you know, the murder of Breonna Taylor and um, the vigilante killing of Ahmaud Arbery um, I think really like struck a chord with people, especially during the pandemic. Uh, so what was interesting about this kind of last sort of uprising or this last sort of um, burst of energy around policing is that you really started to hear the call to defund the police really take off. And, you know, I, I think advocates and activists had been advocating some form of that, you know, going back to, you know, who knows when. So I don't think that it's necessarily a new call, but it really began anew after 2020, right? And by that, I mean, you know, you started to hear the call, not just from activists, but also from a lot of progressive politicians. Uh, I remember, you know, at the sort of height of the protests in 2020, even very mainstream NGOs like Planned Parenthood and ACLU were, if not outright supporting, like indicating, you know, some kind of general, uh, general support for that sentiment. And then, of course, in several major cities, uh, Minneapolis, New York, um, I believe Oakland, Los Angeles, a couple of other cities in California actually went so far as to begin shifting money away from police departments and trying to reallocate it to, you know, like mental health task services or, or mm. just just other sort of non-police uh, public departments. So all that said, it's now two years later. And um, I think in many ways, the momentum to defund the police has more or less collapsed, right? Like the cities that I just mentioned that initially defended their police departments, um, lots of them not only reversed those policies, but started injecting even more money into police budgets. I know there are a couple of cities that like started giving police officers like really lavish bonuses to not leave the police force. And of course there are still activists and politicians who are sticking to the defund line and saying, we really need to defund the police. But that again is in the context of what I think is basically you know, the larger or like the entire Democratic Party, the centrist Democratic Party backing away from the slogan like it's poison. Right. So mm. Joe Biden has recently said, like, we're not going to defund the police. We're going to fund the police even more. So there's there's a couple different things going on. And I would like to get at the question of defunding the police from a couple different angles. But, you know, in light of what I just said, I think it makes sense to start with kind of uh, the problem or the limitation of public opinion. So pretty much all of the available polling at this point indicates that defund the police is not a very popular slogan. I think a lot of people find it confusing. Um, I know that, you know, when in polls, when um, pollsters kind of change the language and instead of saying defund, fun, they say reallocate, that gets like more mixed results. Mm -hmm. But what's really interesting to me is that, um, you know, the slogan just doesn't really seem to have caught on. The slogan and the idea doesn't really seem to have caught on among the general public. And in particular, it doesn't seem to have caught on among working class black respondents, which is a little bit interesting and ironic because this is supposedly the group that, you know, proponents say would benefit disproportionately from a reduction in policing. So this is a very long way. This is a very long winded way of saying, you know, what do you think accounts for this disconnect? And why did this call to defund? on the police sort of catch on with a certain segment of the population, but not others? Yeah, I mean, some of it has to do with um, the way we've, the way a lot of people on the left in particular have um, misread the George Floyd moment, what it represented, um, what we should take away from it. I mean, I think many people saw those protests as an affirmation of Black Lives Matter. And up to a point it was, right? And, mm -hmm. and for a short period it was. There was a short moment during the summer of 2020 when um, a, a majority of American citizens endorsed the basic premise of Black Lives Matter that African-Americans are disproportionately targeted by 
by police, right? Mm -hmm. So in some public opinion polls, that was pretty clear. By the end of the summer, um, by the time of the uh, Jacob Blake shooting in Kenosha, Wisconsin, um, even that support had dissipated, right? And so you saw a swing back against Black Lives Matter um, in the midst of riots and other other uh, problems. And so we know that that public opinion is temperamental. It's it's, yeah. it's oftentimes you know affected by by immediate events. Um, but I think there's a problem of the way in which so many folks on the left just saw this moment as it's all in favor of Black Lives Matter without thinking through the different kinds of motivations of the thousands, if not millions of people who poured out into the streets across the summer of 2020. So I think there's that problem to start, right, that we should be clear that many people were outraged by the killing of George Floyd. That didn't necessarily yeah. mean that they were willing to scale back the size and you know, budget of their police departments locally, mm -hmm. right? So I think there's a way in which we 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 over sold the event, right, to ourselves and to other people. Um, there's also another problem um, that I think we should really think about: the way in which mobilization, uh, popular mobilization, in the sense of you know mobilization of outrage, you know, over a particular event, is not the same as sustained organizing and actually building commitments at the local level. And that hasn't happened in a lot of places. I mean, so mm -hmm. in some larger cities, you can find, you know, dedicated uh, groups of activists who are working to try to push for legislation in, in cities. And, and they're seeing some, you know, some gains in different places. We could talk about the specific things that have happened right. over the last two years. But I think that um, one of the problems with defund is, you know, it doesn't necessarily get at the, the, the need for police. Mm -hmm. Right. That many people have and that there are real quality of life crimes that take place. There, there are still issues of violence in many cities. Um, and I don't think that calling for defund, you know, really um, awakens, you know, or, or convinces people that this is a, a, a viable path. Right. I mean, I think there's some virtues to it, you know, so I'm not a complete. um critic when it comes to defund. I think it has helped to reorient some of the conversation about spending priorities in cities, about uh, more progressive investments in people, um, especially mm -hmm. in cities where they've been uh, neglected and abandoned, you know, certain neighborhoods have been abandoned and left to policing, right? Um, but I don't think it goes far enough, right? And I think mm -hmm. there's, there was, there's sort of a, um, a frontier that we need to think about where we're not just simply calling for defunding police, but we're actually forcing people to have a broader discussion about spending priorities in cities um, yeah. because tremendous amounts of resources are um, transferred over to uh, corporations for investment in cities, right? To build right. the tourism entertainment sector of cities, to try to lure uh, transnational corporations to invest and to build headquarters or manufacturing facilities in cities. And that isn't on the table when we talk about defund. Right. We're only focused on the police budget and not the broader uh, apparatus that's being mobilized um, to the disadvantage of many working class residents who live in and around uh, you know, major cities in the US. So I just think there's a much more substantial redistributive conversation we can have yep. that defund just does not uh, give us right. I mean, it mm -hmm. cracks the door open to that conversation, but um, but it's really one that the left should be hammering away at. You know, uh, if we want to actually have a left in this country, um, and what I've noticed is that whenever I have conversations with citizens and students and other folks about um, these these spending, you know, uh, the inequality in spending, you know, the kinds of money we just throw away at corporations, the immediate response from them is why. Why are we doing this? Why are we sort of subsidizing stadium construction and, you know, um, yeah. the the other kinds of condo tower construction and all these other things? There's tax breaks, there's land grants, there's all sorts of infrastructure giveaways that we're, we're doing. And yet that that doesn't draw the same outrage as a police budget, right? When it right. should, it, it really right. should, because it has direct bearing on the kinds of... of um, lives that many people have, you know, uh, in cities. So yeah. I just think defund doesn't go far enough. Um, and, and at the same time, I don't think that uh, Black Lives Matter activists have made the case mm 
clearly enough for why we should defund or even abolish police, right? You know, um, you know, I don't think, and this sort of you know puts me sort of on the the more, according to them, the more conservative end of the spectrum. I don't think we can have the kind of complex urban society that we have mm-hmm. um, without some legitimate use of a uh, force, right, to back mm-hmm. the laws that we have. I mean, mm-hmm. if you can show me a society of this size, historically, that is operated without courts, without police of some sort, right? I mean, the problem for me is that the police and the courts uphold a highly unequal system, right? That's what mm-hmm. they protect. And I think we can yeah. find other examples of societies that uh, were socialist, um, social democratic, that still needed police in order to, to defend the social, right? They needed to defend the society against, um, you know, its alternatives. So right. I just think it's somewhat naive and the case hasn't really been made effectively uh, beyond the most, um, you know, activist uh, segments of the population. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the comment you make about uh, the sort of defund conversation kind of opening the door to this larger question of like where we should be spending money, I think is Mm -hmm. um, very apt. But something that I sort of constantly think about, and I'm not the only one by far who's pointed this out, is that the police budget as large as it may seem in a city like New York City, their police budget is like six million or sorry, six billion dollars. That mm. seems like a lot of money, but like that is actually not even enough, not close to enough money to say fund education in New York. Right. The DOE uh, budget is something like, you know, over 30 billion dollars. So, mm. you know, I, I think that in some cases, at least for me, like the math doesn't really quite seem to work out, even though obviously I understand the impulse very much to want to shift money away from policing and put right. it into social services. Um, but right. I guess to follow off that follow from that, um, do you think that defunding the police is something that the left should continue fighting for? And then like you had mentioned, you thought that there were some sort of positive changes or steps forward that were made in the last year or two. Um, can you mm-hmm. talk a little bit more about those? Yeah, so we've seen um, a number of different jurisdictions, you know, uh, revised like use of force policy, right? Mm-hmm. And and I'm not one of these people who's kind of all or nothing. I think that if there's <laughs> if there's some incremental changes that can reduce the the numbers of fatal police civilian encounters, I'm all for it, right? So mm-hmm. revising use of force policy in some places has meant just simply uh, making sure that police don't fire on moving cars. Or that they <laughs> right. I was going to say on... that's a New York one that they right, passed. I right. think in the seventies, like, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> exactly. Right. Or yeah. like fire on on suspects who are you know uh, fleeing on foot. Right. You right. Know, like, so yeah. that sort of thing. Um, so I think those are all great things. We've also seen, you know, um, some jurisdictions who lag behind, like the bigger cities, who are like now purchasing body cameras. Right. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. again, like that, that's not going to necessarily save lives, but it does sort of you know, change the the way that police interact with, it can change the way that police interact with with civilians. Um, So there are things like that. And then you also have, you know, at least a few locales that have moved towards, um, you know, uh, creating different units that will respond to mental health crises. Um, I think that's important, you know, kind of reducing the kinds of incidents that police respond to, maybe having trained professionals who know how to deal with different kinds of mental health uh, conditions. Um, that makes sense in the different different places that have that have pursued that. Um, so, yeah, there's a few things that are happening in, in a few places. As far as defund, though, I just don't think it's I think we need to to pay attention to the public, right? And mm-hmm. and maybe change course. I don't think the issue or the focus should be defund or even abolish um, police. We should be focused on abolishing the conditions that police right. are there to, to manage, right? And I think there's probably more of a base available for that, um, you know, in, in cities, right? And in suburbs even, right? People who use the city, um, because most of us want to feel secure. And I think there's a way that we can achieve public safety by, again, eliminating um, the kind of dispossession that exists in cities, the uh, unemployment and poverty that exists in cities, and, you know, uh, reduce the 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 um, 
likelihood that people have to rely on criminalized forms of work um, or survival crimes, right, mm-hmm. in order to to make it, right? I mean, I think that's the fundamental problem um, in cities, and that's where our focus should be, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we should we should in some places reduce the size of police budgets or right size. Uh, police, police shouldn't be responding to every uh, issue, you know, everywhere. But there's some places where they need it, right? I mean, you know, here in Chicago, we have, um, at least by in terms of mileage of of track, the second largest uh, rail system, you know, urban rail system in the country, mm-hmm. and we have not had um, a dedicated police force on the CTA um, in since 1981, right? right? And, you know, there's times when I'm riding a train late at night and some of these platforms are completely abandoned, right? There's yeah. nobody around. And crime happens on these on these trains, right? We had an yeah. incident just last week where a CTA worker was pushed out onto the tracks. Now, it's not to say that a police presence would have would have saved them or pre- mm-hmm. prevented that from happening. But, um, but there's a need for it, right? We had, you know, a few years ago, one of our students here at UIC was uh was exiting the train station on our campus. She was stalked by somebody who uh who raped and murdered her in in, in one of our uh, you know parking garages on campus. Yeah. So there's a need for it. Um I'm not saying that they'll solve all the problems, but right. many people, you know, who who I think we need to listen to actually feel that there's a need for for more um more protection in, in, in some aspects of the society, right? Mm-hmm. You know, some mm-hmm. some places. You know, I, I remember when the defund the, the police call was sort of starting to, you know, bubble up. Um, I know that a few left critics of defund, and I'll just go say, go ahead and say myself included, were a mm. little bit worried that this this idea to defund the police, aka take money out of, you know, this this department, would sort of become an inadvertent smokescreen or an inadvertent Trojan horse for austerity. And right. especially because it was like happening during the same time at the pandemic, and you saw a lot of cities trying to pare back their budgets anyway. Um, that was the fear that it would sort of dovetail perfectly with the ongoing push for austerity by you know yeah. local, state, and federal governments that we've all grown used to. Do you think there's any part of that fear that was borne out, or do you? I don't know. Like, was that kind of a, a, a something that never came to fruition? I mean, I think there's there's reason to to believe that's a possibility, right? Um, yeah. You know, the it's it's funny when when the American Legislative Exchange Council comes out in favor of, of uh restorative justice. I mean, what are we to make of that, right? You right. know, and this is a group that's tried to stump out, you know, uh public sector employees for decades, right? Why mm-hmm. wouldn't they be, you know, why wouldn't they want to use um police unions as mm-hmm. The beachhead, you know, to begin that process of of eliminating, you know, other forms of of unionized public workers in cities. So there's that. Right. There's also the fallacy among many people uh, on the left that somehow police unions are responsible for the level of violence that we have, that they protect bad cops. Right. And there's at least some evidence that, you know, in states, you know, especially right to work states in the South. You actually have higher levels of of uh, fatal police civilian encounters, you know, than you do in states where police are unionized, right? So, right. I don't think that's a it's a legit thing, but it operates at the level of belief for many people on the left that you cannot criticize that, right? You can't say, mm-hmm. well, you know, police right. unions actually aren't really the problem. Um, if you say that, then you'll just be sort of spurned in, in different circles. So. I think we have to keep, you know, keep pushing each other to uh, to think critically about this and not end up on the wrong side. Right. But, Mm -hmm. you know, when I listen to some of the restorative justice arguments, when I listen to these anti-police union arguments, they are uh, primed for um, appropriation by various right wing forces in, in different parts of the country. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I want to go back also to something that you said earlier about um, what kinds of police reforms can actually work. Because another yeah. thing that you hear on the left quite a lot is this line that reform just doesn't work. Right. right. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that when it comes to policing and incarceration. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of criticism of, you know, um, sort of, I guess, more kind of like reformist approaches, like eight can't wait initiative, which, you know, right. I think wants to ban chokeholds and wants to do like body 
cameras and, you know, more sensitivity training. And in a way, I understand the impulse. Like, obviously, those things aren't going to put an end to police violence overnight and Mm -hmm. arguably don't really get at some of the root causes of police violence. Um, But I, I don't know. I just like what you said earlier that, like, any little thing helps kind of. Mm. And, you know, to go back to the New York example of like the reforms that were taken in the seventies, where they said like, you can't really shoot at people from moving cars and so forth. That really did lower the amount of, you know, police killings that happened Mm. in New York city. Now, of course there are still police killings in New York city. And obviously the point is to get those killings down to zero. Right. But um, I, I, I guess the question is like, what does this idea that reform doesn't work miss? Um, I, because again, I do feel like it's coming from a place that's like, well, we, we obviously need more, but, Mm -hmm. um, something that I think Paul Prescott has said in the past is that the flip side is like, when you say reform doesn't work, that can come off as kind of nihilistic or defeatist. And it's Mm -hmm. sort of like, well, how are we going to build a coalition to actually like put an end to police violence? If the immediate, if the immediate line is reform doesn't work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and that's a broader problem, right? We we could focus on policing, but we could also talk about questions of poverty, right? I mean, some yeah. people, I mean, going back, you know, for decades, people have been critical of of um, you know, various forms of technocratic, you know, approaches right. to dealing with poverty as inadequate and reformist. Yeah. And I get that, but um, you know, usually the people who are saying that are not the folks who are mo- most uh, affected by whatever problem those reforms are, are seeking to address. And, you know, uh, I think there's, there's two things at work, right? There's the, the criticism from those of us who have a certain ideological horizon that we're, we're working from, that we want something really grandiose. And then there's the perspective of people on the ground who, um, who may be trying to fight for things that they can win mm-hmm. in, in really specific and oftentimes harsh uh, and an unforgiving context, right? So, you know, if you can get transparency, here's another thing, right? In some states, they've moved towards uh, databases that will track, um, you know, disciplinary actions against police and make those available to the public, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, winning that in in some states, this is huge, right? Because, yeah. you know, it'll, it'll be a tool for activists to use in the future if they want to focus on you know, troublesome cops. Um, but if you're if you're somebody who's operating like an, an you know an ideologue, then of course it'll never be enough until complete abolition or whatever your your horizon might be. So I just think you know we have to start from um, these grounded contexts where people are, how they're living, um, and and what kind of fights we can win at the local level. Because how else are you going to do that kind of deep organizational work that we mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, where you're building support over time and giving people a sense that somehow we can win ultimately, right? right. I mean, because I think that's another thing that for a lot of people in the in the U.S. Um, and many young people who were awakened by the George Floyd um, protests. I mean, how many victories have they witnessed, like real right. concrete organizing victories at the local level? Uh, and you have to have those, right? It's kind of like, you know, if you think about it being analogous to sports, you got to win some some games, right? If you want to start to get confidence enough that you can win a championship, right? So right. I think the same is true with, with us in the struggle around policing, that mm-hmm. we got to win in some places, even if it's small, you know, victories mm-hmm. and not mistaken. I mean, there's been times I remember once when I was on social media, uh, I said something about, you know, some sort of, of a court case, you know, that had like a good outcome. And I was like, you know, finally a victory. Yeah. And some, you know, of course, some snide, you know, grad student chimes in. Well, is this really a victory? You know, like that sort of thing. Right, but that's right. it's, it's noxious and it's it's self-defeating. Right. We'll never be able to gain momentum if we can't do both at the same time, right? Keep our mm-hmm. eye on this broader horizon. And at the same time, think about, you know, what these local and small victories, you know, might mean uh, in terms of building momentum towards something greater. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, 
I, I want to also ask you about this idea of, um, you know, community policing or like this Ooh. idea that the community itself can kind of create, you know, a kind of non-police sort of uh, network of people who know everybody who lives in the neighborhood and, you know, can respond to sort of these crises. I guess this goes back to some of the comments you were saying earlier about uh, restorative justice or, you know, transformative justice or police abolition. That's something that I think a lot of people on the left are very serious about trying to think through now. And, you know, when when I think advocates of defund the police kind of encounter some criticisms, I feel like many of them often respond by saying like, well, defund the police is really just an initiative to start reimagining what the police could be or reimagining what public safety is. Um, do you see any of these kinds of community-based solutions having any legs? Or like, do you see do you think that these are solutions that we should be pursuing or, or that could be sort of scaled up? Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of either community policing or um, in terms of, you know, mitigating local violence to kind of, um, you know, uh, ceasefire type strategies, you know, mm -hmm. mobilizing people to, to do conflict mediation. I'm not really in favor of that, right? I mean, these are creatures of neoliberal times, right? So now, yeah. you know, we, we then begin to outsource what should be um, the work of the state, right? In some ways, in terms of public safety, back onto the public. I mean, right, right. It's it's inadequate, you know. Again, to the scale of societies that we have, right? Um, and scale of, of actual cities that we have. I just don't see how it could how it could work. Um, and it just becomes a way to siphon off energy to you know look for the next foundation grant to try to workshop it out. <laughs> Um, but it's not going to address the problems that we have, which, again, these are problems of deep inequality that again, mm -hmm. that took root, you know, in the post-war period amid the resegregation of the American population, you know, by way of both suburbanization and um, the making of the second ghetto across across the country. So I think we we have to go back to that. Right. That we have a deeply unequal society. And there are people in our society who've been locked out um, and, and, and aren't going to necessarily find gainful means of employment mm -hmm. um, to survive. I mean, even if we go back to the examples you, you mentioned before, like Eric Garner, uh, yeah. we could talk about Alton Sterling. We could talk about other other examples. Many of these people were engaged at the time of their arrest. Mm -hmm. They were engaged in, you know, simple forms of, of survival. Mm -hmm. That have been criminalized, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, Eric Garner was was selling Lucy's, you know, these mm -hmm. these loose cigarettes, you know, untaxed. Yeah, George Floyd too. Store. Right, George Floyd. You know, we've got people like um, like uh, Alton Sterling who was selling pirated, you know, CDs in Baton mm -hmm. Rouge in front of a, a gas station. Multiple people who've been pursued and killed by police were engaged in drug dealing. I'm not saying that as a moral judgment against them. You know, I, right. I would yeah. argue that this is like, again, uh, these are simply criminalized forms of work. Right. We have to focus on that. All this other stuff is like smoke and mirrors, right? Community mm -hmm. policing and, and, and everything else. Let's eliminate the inequality that exists in the society. That's mm -hmm. doable, right? Yeah. That's totally yeah. doable. Yeah. Um, but when we get in these concerns about, you know, uh, unionized police, restorative justice, community policing, uh, operation ceasefire type strategies, this is all distraction from yeah. what should be the focus of those of us on the left, which is building uh, a working class centered politics, but not necessarily working class exclusive politics that is anti-capitalist. I mean, that should be our focus mm -hmm. um, because that's what's responsible for the kinds of conditions that Eric Garner, Alton Sterling, and all sorts of other people have to endure, right? Mm -hmm. So I just think that that should be our focus. Um, and we really need to to recommit to that, right, in the midst of, of everything we've seen over the last two years. Right. I, I think I want to end now on this question of the Republican backlash to defund the police, because that's right. obviously something that has, you know, bubbled up as well. Um, and it's not just Republicans, even some Democratic politicians like famously Eric Adams in New York are kind of mm. taking a more hardline sort of law and order approach now. Um, lots of politicians have tried to connect defunding the police and even measures like bail reform to the spike in violent crime that's been happening in major cities over the last year or so. Mm. And, you know, I will just say outright, like, I don't think that there's much evidence that either defunding the police or uh, especially bail reform are what 
directly produced the mm -hmm. increase in violent crime. Um, but at the same time, it does seem like since that's at the top of people's minds, uh, you know, public concern over public safety does mm -hmm. seem to make it harder to reform the criminal justice system. Like bail reform was a good idea, but it seems like it might be rolled back in New York now because of, you know, Eric Adams and Kathy Hochul and kind of the push to connect that to the spike in crime. So right. I guess the last question for you is how do you think we can you know, adequately balance real public concerns around public safety while continuing to push for criminal justice reform? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so my my argument, I think I've made this, you know, in a few different places before. My argument is that, again, abolish the conditions, focus mm -hmm. in on the kinds of, of localized uh, strategies that might actually gain traction among um, publics. And I think you know, returning to old style public works, you know, I've made this argument in a few different places. It's something that could work in a, in a number of different cities, right? I mean, it would be ideal if it could operate nationally, but we do know that, you know, states and locales sometimes are the laboratories where policy is, is uh, you know, experimenting on first before it's scaled upwards. And in a city the size of Chicago, in a place the size of, of Los Angeles, you know, LA County, you could imagine a public works, um, project in a genuine sense, right, of, of like an old New Deal style where it's like publicly funded and publicly managed, um, where you you hire people, not just the most desperately unemployed, but people in general to do different forms of work that are necessary and that might be organized more around uh, use value than what's, what's profitable, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, care work could be one area that this could, this could uh, work in a completely devalued uh, form of work or sector within our uh, society. You could see um, transportation, right? You know, like the, the kind of thing I mentioned earlier where you could enhance and improve um, the kinds of, of amenities that people have on, on public transit uh, by using the same sort of workforce. You could also have people engaged in what do they want, right? Sort of democratic uh, decision making about what kinds of things particular neighborhoods need and want, and then deploy uh, labor in that regard. So I think we have to reimagine that. Now, of course, whenever I bring it up in certain circles, there's always this pessimistic, you know, uh, you know, cynical part of the left where people really don't think anything is possible, right? Mm. Uh, unless it's like the full form society that they dream about at night. Right. Um, but we can't afford to do that, right? We have to think mm -hmm. about creative strategies and we have to also think about strategies that, are, that can gain traction among um, the living, breathing publics in our midst, right? I think that's yeah. the bigger issue because if we don't, then we'll continuously, you know, stall out in terms of thinking about, you know, things like defund, mm -hmm. which which don't really resonate so much with the public that has to deal with real crime. Right. You know, yeah. especially right now. And, you know, it's we got a lot of work in front of us. You know, I don't you know, I don't have any any romantic views about about the tough, tough road ahead. But right. I just think as much as we can um take people's uh, needs as sincere, right? I mean, crime is a real is a real issue, right? It's not, especially for certain parts of the black and brown, you know, population, right? right? You know, they're, they're the main uh, targets oftentimes of various forms of violence and theft and other, other issues. So um, having lived, you know, uh, throughout my life in black and brown neighborhoods is real, right? Your car yeah. gets broken in too. Uh, I've been in an armed robbery, you know, before. So it's like those things happen. They're real, yeah. right? It's not. It's not just the fantasies of white suburbanites right. um, that drove us to some of the, the the expansions of policing that we have. But there's real quality of life issues in black and brown neighborhoods that we need to take seriously. And that doesn't mean um, more police. It means us thinking creatively about how do we address again this deep inequality. Mm -hmm. That still defines uh, American society, which isn't strictly racial, right? It's not. Right. It's not a problem that's always experienced uh, in black and white, especially when we get outside of urban context and begin to yeah. spend time in other other parts of the country, right? So I think we have to, you know, think seriously and creatively about um, how do we address deep inequalities um, that police are here to to manage, right? How do we sort of yeah. focus on that? Because that's really the main problem. Right. The mm -hmm. policing part is uh, 
is uh, a dimension of it, but it's not the it's not the core problem itself. Yeah. Well said. Uh, all right. So Cedric Johnson's book, again, is The Panthers Can't Save Us Now. That's out from Verso, and we will link that in the description box below. Cedric, thank you so much for your time. It was great to talk to you. Thank you so much. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks. Thanks.